The third divine institution is the family. The Bible teaches that the family is to be the primary and most basic foundation for a stable society. The father and mother are entrusted by God with the responsibility of instilling respect for authority, self-control, self-discipline, honesty, honor, and respect for others. When families do this in any society, that society will be strong. When the family breaks down, the society will disintegrate in proportion to it. Adam taught his sons the way to forgiveness with God. Abel believed it, but Cain did not. So Abel brought an animal sacrifice to God from his flock. Cain brought the works of his own hands. Strangely, this was the first act of religion. That is, trying to come to God by one's own works. The Bible spells out in detail that parents are to be the trainers of their children. And Adam's act there was the first uh, evidence of him training or trying to train his children. This responsibility should never be relinquished to a nanny, to a school, or to the state. The Proverbs of the Bible provide very explicit admonition to parents about training their children. These practices are to be followed by parents who are not just venting their frustration. They are to be administered by a parent who loves his child and who has self-control over his own or her own temper. And they should be practiced consistently before the child pushes the parent into a rage. Now, I want to say at this point, I realize that there are a lot of single parents out there that are single parents not by their own choice. And you say, well, what do I do? Well, I know that God, if you throw yourself upon him and you trust him, will give you the ability to instill the right kind of disciplines into your child as you trust him. Because God knows that you're trusting him and that there's nothing else you can do. Now, this is what the Lord says through the writers of the Proverbs. In Proverbs 22, verse 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. In chapter 22, verse 15, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24, says, He who withholds his rod hates his son. But he who loves him disciplines him diligently. Now, I want you to think about that last proverb because a lot of people say, oh, I would never strike my child with a belt or with uh, a switch or something of that sort. I love him too much. Well, this says, if you withhold that kind of discipline when it's needed and when you're under control, then you don't love the child. You hate him. Now, in chapter 23, verses 13 and 14, we get an even more strict instruction. He says, Do not hold back discipline from the child. Although you strike him with a rod, he will not die. You shall strike him with a rod and rescue his soul from hell. And finally, Proverbs 29, verse 15, The rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. The Apostle Paul also writes about the family's importance and centrality. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. When a child is raised with a consistent father and mother, he becomes an asset and a blessing to his society, and he can live a full and useful life. Now, I realize that all of this goes totally contrary to what parents are taught today in this age of Dr. Spock 
and the impact of modern psychology, so-called. But you know something? Man's nature hasn't changed, and neither has God's word about a child's need for correction, because that nature is the same as it was when God wrote these Proverbs. One of the signs Paul gives as a cause of the perilous times predicted for the end of this age is that children would be in rebellion. It says, disobedience to parents. And as the family breaks down, the child tends to perpetuate the breakdown into the next generation. And after a few generations, the whole nation begins to fall apart with lawless, lawlessness and crime. Jails cannot hold the number of criminals. <laughs> Does this sound familiar? The fourth divine institution is the sanctity of life. God severely judged Cain for the murder of his brother, but God spells out the reason for the sanctity of life in Genesis chapter 9 more explicitly. The Bible says, Surely I will require your lifeblood from every beast I will require it, and from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For it's in the image of God he made man. Now note carefully that human life is sacred because mankind is made in the image of God. In this divine declaration, the ultimate authority for human government is given. It is the responsibility of a duly organized court of fellow humans to execute the person that has deliberately taken the life of another human. And this is done at the command of God because that human that was murdered was in his image. Even an animal that kills a human being is to be put to death. This is not some judgment for primary purpose of crime prevention, but because a person who is in the image of God has been killed. The Bible recognizes that someone can accidentally kill another person. In fact, in the Old Testament, Israel was commanded to set up cities of refuge. And cities of refuge were designated to prevent revenge killings in such cases. This aspect of the law does have an effect on crime of murder. And it does prevent the murderer from getting out and killing again. In fact, the Bible doesn't leave the option of life in prison. It says someone who is deliberately murdered should be put to death. And this commandment is not annulled in the New Testament, as some try to say. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22 in the Sermon on the Mount, You have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into fiery hell. Far from annulling the commandment about capital punishment, Jesus taught that in God's sight, hatred towards someone is considered murder and breaking that law because hatred is the root of the source of murder. If it's not controlled by the restraint of society, it would result in murder. This is apparent when a disaster strikes and law and order breaks down. The law of the jungle takes over because of the fallen nature of man. As we will see, nothing else in American society is more inconsistently handled than this divine institution. The sanctity of the life of a whale is more important to some liberals than the life of a baby. When respect for the sanctity of life breaks down, the society is headed for destruction in a hurry. And as the society declines, it becomes an extremely dangerous place to live.